So I want to welcome everybody to today's meeting of the Pickwick Club, sponsored by the uh, Dickens Project at UC Santa Cruz and the Dickens Fellowship of Santa Cruz. I'm going to wait another couple of minutes for latecomers to get settled in. I see many familiar faces. Um, we have uh, Ava Brennan is here with us. Ava, wave and let people know that you're here. If there are any technical difficulties, Ava will help us out. I've been um, talking about Tim Clark that uh, if you're name shows up on the screen as Tim Clark, and you would like to change it to your proper name, uh, Ava can help you do that if you, if you wish. If you, if you signed in directly with your name when you registered, then there's no prob problem. But if you signed in using a link that Tim Clark provided, you will be named Tim Clark. Couldn't I couldn't quite hear what uh, was being said. Carl Holshue, I'd like to have my own name. Somebody turned me into Steve Peppy. Steve. Ava, Carl. No, with its K. Can you do that, Ava? Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to <laughs> be renamed? Raise your hand if you want to have uh, your name changed. I think we were all good. Gotten all the okay. tips. I, th I think we should go ahead and begin. Um, I'm John Jordan and uh, I'm from UC Santa Cruz and uh, I, I have the pleasure of convening these meetings of the Pickwick Club, uh, which originates from Santa Cruz, but is uh, uh, available to people from all around the world. And so we have uh, people in attendance today who are not in Santa Cruz, who come from many different parts. And our leader for today, our leader of discussion is Catherine Springer. Uh, Catherine Springer is uh, from Atlanta and uh, a regular attender, attendee of the Dickens universe. And I'm gonna just turn things over to Catherine who will uh, introduce today's readings. Take it away, Catherine. Can you hear me? We're, you're still muted. Okay. There um, we go. No, I'm not, right? Okay, I'm Catherine Springer. I live in Atlanta. Atlanta. And uh, a long time ago, I was a high school English teacher. Now I work as a tutor. And um, a couple of years ago, Clark and I went to the universe for the first time. And it was an incredible experience, which uh, I would say is pretty life changing. We've spent a lot of our time and energy appreciating Dickens since then. And it's been delightful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with our section. Ava, do you want to just queue up the title slide just so we can refresh everyone's memory about um, about what, about the section we're reading? So just so you guys, in case you needed to reference, like these are the chapters we're covering. Um, and that's a little that's a little picture of our friend Magwitch from the Plants series, if any of you guys know about those from the auction, another one of my favorite items. Um, let's go, can we go back one more? Okay, so I just want to, I just want to start by talking a little bit about, about how last, one of the things that, I mean, Pip, Pip did a lot of traveling around. He went, he started in London, seeing Hamlet, then he went to Richmond, then he went to see the pockets at Hammersmith, then he went to the, to the Finches meeting in London, then he went to the, um, the forge because Mrs. Joe died. And then he went to Woolworth to see Wemmick. And then he went to Saddis House to see Miss Havisham. So there was a lot of traveling around. This section by comparison is very limited, at least in the first four chapters, 
to where PIP is. We are mostly in PIPs. That's just really interesting because even though PIP is not literally traveling, there's a lot of psychological journeying going on in that in this section. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Ava. This is just a recap of the of the chapters. So the first chapter is Magwitch is coming back. Um, and then the second chapter, Pip is just processing that. He's still in his apartment. He goes out to visit Jaggers for a minute. Um, the next one, Herbert comes in to help Pip out of his dilemma. Um, then we have Magwitch telling his story. Then we have Pip going to talk to Estella, but instead finding Drummel. Um, and then the last one is where he gets the terrible news, the second piece of terrible news in the section from his point of view that Estella is marrying Drummel and his life is over. Um, let's go to, let's go to the next slide and then I'm gonna start us talking. So this, this slide, I, I found some illustrations that I thought were really um, captivating. And this section, I feel like sort of sums up how Pip feels after he hears the news about Magwitch, which is that he, his life, he feels like his, his compass is broken. He can't process anything. He literally can't even stand up or stay or chair. He just collapses to the floor. And I think that this image really captures like how Pip is feeling right right then. Um, so I kind of, with that, I kind of want to open, open it up with a question of what do you guys think about Magwitch coming back? And what did you think about Pip's reaction to Magwitch? So people should raise their hands if they want to be called on. Uh, or just start talking if anyone is inspired. So, Lena, why don't we then ask Dan to speak, and we'll get back to Glenna when she gets her microphone figured out. Hey, Dan. Yeah. So, um, I'm glad Catherine brought up the idea of this kind of prior engagement with Estella, where he kind of overhears, or at least he discovers from Drummle that um, you know they're going to be engaged and married, because I think it carries over into this section where the convict arrives, where Magwitch arrives, and kind of, it's another letdown, it's another repulsion for Pip, it's another uh, denial of the respectability he's hoping for because, you know, Magwitch is so repulsive to him, this this idea that this um, this world that he's constructed, constructed for himself, this fantasy world of being kind of Miss Havisham's, uh, um, or her being his benefactor is is no longer the case, and he's kind of denied uh, further, you know, this, this kind of, um, Fantasy, fantasy that you know he'd put together for himself, and it's and it's kind of a a, la a successive layer of kind of disappointments and disillusionments, and these kind of illusions that are shattered uh, over the course of several weeks, I would say, or even really just a few moments you know, when he does meet Magwitch. And I think it's really important to kind of think about you know the internal life that he has and match that to the external circumstances that are really kind of uh, disassembling before him, and really the you know the the steadily crumbling identity that he's having to face uh within himself okay good 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 start about this so uh let's go on and get some other responses david i had a thought this time in rereading the book and it seems we're on the topic <clears throat> Why uh, why do Pip and Herbert agree without discussion or examination that it's just not possible for Pip to take money from Magwitch? They were both okay with his being funded by Miss Havisham, who is deranged. Uh, Magwitch says he's earned this money 
honestly, I have an answer, but I don't like it very much. And I'm hoping someone will come up with something better. Okay, good good question. Do do people have uh, responses to the question that David has has asked? Why why is it that Pip and also Herbert uh, assume that taking money from Magwitch is something that they that Pip cannot do, whereas taking money from Miss Havisham is perfectly okay? So, I have a I have a thought about that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah, obviously a class thing. Uh, that that Miss Havisham, you know, starts out being being you know upper class, and uh, you know she's presumed that you know if you fall into that into that arena, that people just hand out money to each other. But you know, somehow or another, there's something there's something dubious about about uh, about Magwitch because he's he's utterly like lower class he's lumping proletariat you now he's worse than the working person he's a, he's a criminal lumping proletariat and you, you can't touch that kind of person and that the, there's there's a contamination associated with the money associated with with his uh his class and uh even if he did earn it you know legitimately in australia Actually, that's another question I have. How did he get all that money in Australia? Because I don't believe it. But anyway, the the uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, it's, it's a class thing, I think. Um, anyway, I was also, also going to add that uh, in this in this when I reread this chap this chapter, I was really surprised by the you know the the storm at the beginning. Dickens like playing with the storm as as he played with it in David Copperfield. You know, it's like he's he's gone back to the st a storm as a as a as a as a metaphor for emotional conflict or something. That the, the storm is a preparation for all the emotional conflict that we're going to see in Geek yeah, and Pip. But anyway, I think it's a class issue. Uh, uh, and and uh, to add to that. This time around, I, I saw Mag, which I actually saw a little bit of the same issue with that that uh, Pip has with uh, with Joe. I saw Mag, which is a, as a, maybe a double for Joe, except except uh, uh, the, because Joe is Joe is like lower class and Mag, which is even worse. So I see I see like Joe returning in um, in Mag, which although Pip probably doesn't see that. No. Okay, good observations and uh, uh, at least a, a stab at answering uh, David's question about the, the money. Uh, Josephine. Hi, everybody. I'm new. Catherine is a Dickens evangelist, and that's why I'm here. Okay. And I, I agree about the class element to his revulsion around Magwitch, but also Magwitch scared the heck out of him. I mean, he was trying to kill him as a child. I mean, I don't think it's just class. I think there's also this, this carried um, traumatic event that Pep had where he was, you know, threatened with his life as a wee kid. Um, so I, I think the class thing is, is part of it, but I imagine... Pip's lived experience of this man isn't just his revulsion at how he eats, but it's his fear and remembered fear about his um, threatening him. Okay. Can I just ask Ava to show a couple slides real quick that I, um, can you just show the slide that, the, the slide five for me, Ava? Just to go, just to, just because I want, um, I think what Peter mentioned about the weather was like really, I love this line much when he repeats stormy and wet storm and mud, mud, mud deep in all the streets. And in this, all these chapters, there's, it's like crazy weather and lots of mud. So I just want to look at that. And then I also, can you go to slide um, seven, which has, um, this is an image of, as a little kid with Magwitch like tilting him back and he does like just like Josephine said like there's that recollection 
that's always in his mind of of Magwitch's violence. Okay, thank you. Sorry, you guys okay, are good. Good reminders. Good reminders. Um, Pat had a hand up. Is it? Uh, did you want to? Well, yeah, and... sure. Uh, I, I, um, I was wondering if it might still be guilt from uh, recollection of what he had done to help Magwitch uh, when he was in Joe and uh, Mrs. Joe's home. Uh, but that might be a little off base. Okay. Um, Margaret. Uh, yes, I'd like I'd like to uh, to say that question. Is Magwitch a father figure to Pip? Where is Pip's father figure? It's not Joe. Joe is the best of friends. And as somebody just rightly pointed out, there is a relationship mm -hmm. between the character of Joe and of Magwitch. But somehow in this reading of it, I'm seeing Magwitch as somehow a father figure to to uh, to Pip, and that even as Magwitch had threatened Pip's life in the graveyard, Pip had actually saved his life. And there's an old Confucian say, saying that those whose lives you save, you're stuck with them throughout your life, <laughs> that you're responsible for them throughout your life. And, and I'd like to question, what is the responsibility that Pip is feeling toward Magwitch, and as it grows and it gets more, more he gets more and more entangled with Pip, and he's he gets more and more responsible for for uh, for Magwitch's life. I might have said the wrong word there. He, Pip gets more and more entangled with Magwitch, and just as his revulsion goes, I, I totally agree with the gentleman who spoke. I think it was Peter who said that it was a class thing. Of course, it is a class thing. And that was em em is emphasized throughout this chapter about the way that Magwitch eats and uh, and every and his whole manner. But uh, I'd I'd like to just throw in that possibility that Magwitch is a father figure to Pip. Let's let's hold on to that idea and expand on it. But uh, we'll come back in in a couple of minutes uh, after other people have. Who have hands up have spoken, Mary, and then Glenna. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Um, on a totally practical level, um, although I agree that it's probably a class thing, there's also the fact that everywhere Magwitch goes, he's followed by policemen and people who want to lock him up. And I think Pip is sensible enough to realize that he doesn't want any part of that, whereas Miss Havisham doesn't have anybody following her. And so he wouldn't be complicit in anything in particular by taking money from her, whereas the risk of taking money from Magwitch, even if it was honestly earned, seems to me to be dangerous. That That's a, a good point, a, a practical uh, <laughs> uh, concern that Pip may have. You don't want to be involved with a, with a criminal and uh, to, to be involved with a criminal may incriminate you. Um, Pip wants to keep his distance from criminality, although he sometimes, um, we might even say, has himself been a criminal stealing the bread and the brandy or what he thinks is brandy from Mrs. Joe at the beginning. Of yeah, but in his own mind, he's now a gentleman, so he doesn't want to take any risks. In his own mind, he's a gentleman, but uh, um, he, he, he doesn't want to think about his origins. Uh, right. Definitely not those of a gentleman. But Glenna, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I hope I fixed it. Um, I want to talk about Magwitch's neediness. We, I mean, here's a man, well, we learn more details about it in a couple of chapters, but 
he has never had kindness in his life. And again, the fact that Pip, as a little boy, extends this kind of coerced kindness is the kindest thing anybody's ever done to him. And he projects onto Pip, you know, all the feelings that he would like to have reciprocated. And I think a lot of us get uncomfortable when we're confronted with a level of neediness. Magwitch is all neediness and not just needing to be protected from uh, being taken up, but he needs so much emotional uh, return from his investment in Pip, and that has to be very off-putting and terrifying. Those are excellent points, I think. Uh, we have to, you know, so the, the whole novel is told from Pip's perspective. And so we're inside Pip's mind and Pip's psychology and Pip's fear and Pip's dread. Um, but there's also an entire chapter in which Magwitch gets to tell the story of his life. And so we need to think about Magwitch's psychology and Magwitch's interiority. And the points that Glenna makes, I think, are very, very good ones. So, uh, uh, Martha. Martha, you're muted. I'd like to talk about Pip's whole world is falling apart because his fantasy of having received this money from Miss Havisham and his um, belief that someday he's going to have Estella, um, the whole thing has fallen apart and he's crushed, totally crushed emotionally. And he puts it out, you know, he takes it out on Magwitch. Yes. And P Pip has been living in a in a fantasy world. Um, we could even say it's a fairy tale world in which Miss Havisham is the fairy godmother who has recognized the essential worthiness and virtue of, of Pip and has chosen him to be the prince in a fairy tale uh, where he will get to marry the princess. And that fantasy world is now collapsing. So the image of Pip uh, lying on the floor is, uh, is a good representation of the collapse of that fairy tale for him. Wayne. Yes, I, I, I agree that there's a problem with snobbery here as Peter pointed out, and they're conventional snobs, so that receiving money from a superior is acceptable. And the superior, in this case, Mrs. Havisham, Mrs. Havisham would have right, uh, right to impose uh, expectations or obligations on the recipient. But both Herbert and Pitt can't get their mind around the possibility that Magwitch Magwitch's money would impose could impose obligations on Pip, and he that that upsets the the uh, the hierarchy here terribly for both of them. What obligations would it impose on on Pip? Oh, uh, life decisions, for example, or uh, uh, anywhere from having a Magwitch live with him, or having to introduce Magwitch to to his friends <laughs> and embarrass him completely. For starters, anyway. Yes, there's a wonderful moment in uh, in this this chapter in which Pip um, pretends to be hospitable to Magwitch and says, "Would you like something to drink before you go?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that sentence, uh, "Before you go." Uh, <laughs> uh, is an indication of Pip's uh, refusal of any further obligation toward Magwitch. Okay, you've come to thank me. Um, very good, it was kind of you. Uh, and it also, there's, there's another, <laughs> another detail, uh, which is that um, he asks Magwitch if Magwitch sent someone to um, give him uh, money. 
And you remember there's the convict who comes and gives Pip a one pound note. And that one pound note, if you go back and look at the passage in which the, 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 the money is handed to Pip, is one that smells and it's, it's, it's wrinkled and it's been uh, uh, secreted in, in foul smelling places. And so Pip pulls out his wallet uh, and he produces a crisp, clean one pound note and he gives it to Magwitch or he offers it to Magwitch. And I think that's an important seen in this in this whole chapter because Pip received dirty money from Magwitch and he's going to pay off his debt with clean money. And Pip thinks that there's a distinction between dirty money and clean money. Dirty money comes from a convict, clean money, well, clean money comes from Miss Havisham. Uh, so it's it's a question of class, I think, difference. It's a question of obligation. Uh, the money that Pip has, that he thinks comes from Miss Havisham, carries no obligations, as 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 you point out. Uh, the dirty money from Magwitch carries the obligation of taking care of uh, um, um, uh, an ugly despicable looking, filthy, violent criminal who says, Pip, I'm your second father. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes back to the, the, the theme of, of the father and, and I, that was, uh, was raised before. And I think we, we really need to talk more about fathers in Great Expectations. Uh, John, I'd like to add one thing Please. Uh, yes, you ask what uh, Magwitch might demand. I think it, Pip is very disturbed because Magwitch really wants affection, demonstrate, de demonstrative affection, with which Pip is totally unfamiliar until a little bit later on, uh, there's a little bit of affection between, between him and Herbert. But I think uh, uh, Pip dreads the different kind of relating that Magwitch uh, certainly represents. Thanks. How, how, how does Magwitch's need for affection, I think that's a very good point, how does Magwitch's need for affection from Pip get expressed? Well, on the first meeting, he tries to embrace Pip a couple of times, and Pip recoils. <laughs> and uh, I think at that point, Magwitch threatens to beat him if he, if he repulses him anymore. Magwitch is always reaching out his hands to Pip, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. as if to grasp him. It's very grasping. And um, most of the Pip recoils, but there's one time where, where Pip does let him hold his hand, which I thought yes. was remarkable. And hands are an important motif in this entire novel. Remember, Pip was brought up by hand, but brought up by hand means the rough hand of Mrs. Cho. It's not the affectionate, smooth, or loving hand. And here's here's Magwitch who shows up and reaches out his hands to Pip as if to embrace him, uh, or at least to make physical body contact with dear boy. He keeps calling him dear boy, dear boy, through this entire passage. So. Uh, Magwitch's need for affection and for contact with Pip, I think, is is important to recognize. So, Karen. Yeah, um, the whole issue of hands in the novel, I think um, um, Bob Patton came up to Santa Fe and taught a course on Great Expectations, and he was always pointing out the use of hands and what they symbolized and um, what that they always meant something but one of the chapters in this section it was part three chapter one i just started circling hand in that chapter alone there are 12 references to hand and it is what Catherine says i mean the exhibition of the need for affection where magwitch constantly holds or 
goes forward with his hands to Pip and then tries to hold hands and that sort of thing. But 12 references in one chapter. Yes. It yes. goes on and on. So, <laughs> hey, Ava, can I show a couple slides real quick? I just want to show. Um, let's see which slide, which one is it? Slide six. This is uh, two. Go back one. Um, two images, two illustrations of Magwitch coming in, and I, I picked the first one because uh, I think it's interesting that Pip looks like a little kid there, because I feel like he he's kind of having these flashbacks. Um, and the second one I picked because of that hand thing, because because it's like this is this is Magwitch's signature with Pip is always holding out his hands. And then I also just wanted to show slide eight really quick, which is um, this one where, you know, Pip is on the couch and Magwitch is, is holding his hand to his, holding his lips to Pip's hand and grasping his hand. And it's, I mean, he's trying, he's really seeking a lot of intimacy there that Pip obviously is not interested in returning. I even, there was one part in here where he like, he, he reached, pocket to get his watch out and also like grasps Pip's ring like he's just trying to take own him really okay that's good thank you Karen did you have something you wanted to add your hand was up yeah so we, we, your your hand was up <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, so let's, let's stop a minute and, and think about hands, not hands, think about fathers together. Um, who are the candidates? I mean, Pip, Pip is an orphan. He, he, he does not have a father. So the father slot, the father position, if you will, in in this novel is an empty slot. And when you have an empty slot, it's one of the things that's very useful about having an orphan as a principal character is that many figures may pass through that empty position for candidates for, uh, for fathers. So, David. Can't hear you. David, you're muted. Boy, I got it. Okay. There are several faux fathers. Pumble took, for example, Clay's claims to be the founder of Pip's fortunes. Magwitch thinks of himself in a fatherly way. But of course, Pip, not having any sense of relationship with Magwitch, by the time Magwitch shows up, uh, can't be expected to reciprocate. Uh, Mr. Pocket acts, in, at least in a avuncular way. Uncles are often stand-ins for the missing father. So Pumblechook is Uncle Pumblechook, right? And so think of, think about uncles as a as substitute fathers. So, so yes, okay. Alexis, do you want to that to my question? Oh, sorry. Everybody has helped me answer it with more than just class. So many people said good things. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say there was Wemmick and Jaggers are, are also, uh, Jaggers is, is his guardian. He's mentioned several times as his guardian. A guardian yes. be a father. And of course, Wemmick, at least, in, <laughs> at least at home, takes him under his wing. Sometimes the father figures are also siblings or 
sort of not not quite fathers or some sometimes they're <laughs> fathers and sometimes they're their siblings. Joe, for example, right. I, I think is clearly a father figure uh, for for Pip. Um, although when Pip talks about him in the early <clears throat> chapters, he says that Joe was more like a another child in the family, that the only adult there was Mrs. Joe, and that Joe was more of a child uh, and therefore an equal to, to Pip. But clearly, Joe is the is the loving adult uh, male in in Pip's early life. Other other ways in which the the theme of the father is present in this in this novel. Last last month we talked about Hamlet, and I, I think Hamlet is 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 clearly a, a reference point for the theme of the father, the return of the father, the the beginning of Hamlet is the return of the ghost of the father, with a message to the son about something that the son owes to the father, uh, and Magwitch is is that father who comes back from the dead. Where does Magwitch first appear in, in, the, in the story? It's as if he rises up from the grave. Ma Magwitch is, is the, the ghost of the father, uh, the father who haunts Pip. And what do we know about Pip's own father? Not very much, except that Pip carries his name, carries his name, but also disguises himself, calls himself Pip instead of Philip. So is, is Pip acknowledging or trying to avoid his contact with, with the father? I, I looked back to the opening of, of the novel and the first two words of this novel are my father, my father's family name being Pirip, and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So the father is there from the very first two words of, of, of this novel. Mm -hmm. Isn't, there, isn't there a section like, uh, I have the, the Norton edition, but where Pip talks about uh, a ghost uh, that for weeks gone by had passed faces on the street, which I had thought like his. Mm -hmm. Is that Magwitch? Yes. Yeah. It's like that he that that he's already he's sort of anticipated the presence of, and and Magwitch is presented as a ghost. Yes. You know? Yes. I th I think Dickens is very alert to. The unconscious mind, Pip in his unconscious, is carrying that memory, that memory trace, uh, not, not consciously, but uh, in his psyche, in his, um, in his mind somewhere, is that figure which has now come back to haunt him. And what, what about Wemmick? We we didn't really talk much about about Wemmick, um, and Walworth. Wemmick has a father, <laughs> and the aged P is such a wonderful minor character in in this novel, and Wemmick is such a loving son, and Wemmick Wemmick cares for his father. And what does his father do? His father just sits at home and waits for Wemmick to come back from work. And Wemmick at work is all business, but when Wemmick comes home, he and his father play together. Uh, I, I, I think it was uh, um, Clark last time who talked about 
uh, Wemmick as a as an engineer or as a uh, you you had a different phrase for it I think I think Clark but uh, what 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 are the games that that Wemmick plays with the aged pig Clark do you remember what Um, I, I was I was just taken by his mechanical engineering, his uh, ingenuity, and the the way he identifies the house. And um, uh, but the whole arrangement of that place is so fanciful and delightful that this he's built this little <laughs> castle <laughs> with a moat and everything. It's just so uh, he's so clever. Kind and generous. Um, I, 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 and the aged one is just a fantastic character. <clears throat> yes, the aged P. <laughs> Cynthia. Just to add to the Hamlet discussion, uh, when we open up the first chapter for this section, Pip thinks of his sister when he hears Magwitch's footstep. So there's another dead person who's maybe coming back or haunting him. Yes. Miss Havisham is a ghost. The, the ghost of the dead mother. Um, I mean, Pip is haunted by his origins. Uh, those absent figures that manifest themselves in his later life. But just a, a little, a little bit more about the the aged P. I mean, the aged P is 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 a comic figure, but a, a loving relationship between father and son, which is exactly what Pip and and Magwitch do not have, and it's also what Pip has but rejects in his relationship with Joe. I mean. Um, uh, that that phrase "what larks" uh, that is the sort of secret word that that Pip and Joe share, which is about playing together, about having fun together, um, and that that's what Wemmick and the Aged P do. They they have larks together. They play at living in a castle. They play at shooting off a cannon. Uh, and what's the significance of a cannon? Uh, the cannon, of course, goes back to the cannons that go off when a convict has escaped from the hulks. Uh, and the storm at the beginning of, uh, of the, the chapter of Magwitch's return is another place where the sound of thunder is like a cannon. So there are all these, these echoes, literally echoes, sound echoes that link together um, the, the serious, dreadful return of the ghostly father with the playful, tender, familiar uh, sound of the father in that uh, Walworth scene with the aged P. So, Margaret, again. Okay, so uh, to go back to the aged parent, uh, John, you said that he's just there also, you, you you elaborated on that about the relationship between them. But what the aged parent gives is complete approval of his his yeah. son and lo and love, and that is uh, that's so uh, wonderful and and so wonderfully depicted. And yeah. also the the canon. Remember that the canon is going to be uh, to be uh, exploded, <laughs> at least for the birthdays of the aged parent. And what is the magic number? It's like something that some of us share here in this 81, 82, is he 83? <laughs> 83 blasts of the cannon in celebration and jubilation. So uh, I just get very happy thinking of the aged parent. So I'm happy to be able to just say a few words here. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for adding those details. I had forgotten about the birthday celebration, um, but, and and also very importantly, the the loving approval and admiration of of the father for the son uh, 
is what Magwitch is offering. He's got his his hands are out, his arms are open. He wants to embrace Pip and and take pleasure in Pip's what Pip has has become, and Pip wants none of it. Uh, would you like some refreshment before you go? That cruel sentence. Oh. So, anyway, Pumblechook, as a David called him a faux father. Uh, he's a he's also uh, I think someone last time said we should think about benefactors and that Pumblechook is a false benefactor who takes credit for everything that uh, uh, that that Pip has become. Um, and and uh, Pip is offended because, of course, he has his own fantasy about uh, who his benefactor really is. So, yes, Cynthia. And the real false benefactor is Miss Havisham. Yes, yes. who, although she never claims to be the fairy godmother, nevertheless recognizes Pip's belief that it is she and does not attempt to disabuse him of that notion. So she too is complicit in the deception or in aiding and abetting Pip's mistaken belief. So the mother has failed him as well, the fairy godmother, who is not a fairy, but who is a horrible ghost. So was Catherine, Sorry. yes, I was going to say, let's take it, take it back to you. Oh. I thought it was interesting that um, Magwitch's christened name is Abel, um, because of the story in the Bible about Cain and Abel. Um, God favors Abel and Cain out of jealousy kills him. And then God, am I my brother's keeper? And to me, that's sort of a, like, we're trying to think about Pip is kind of in a position where is he going to, is he going to be kind to his, not literal brother, obviously, but to his fellow human by being kind to Magwitch. Um, I think in the same way, like Miss Havisham has that amazing line that I have a about that I can pull up later where she's like who to be kind so there's a, a whole theme about like who are treating each other um Pip kind of has an opportunity here to be kind to Magwitch and so far he's not really taking advantage of it he just wants to get rid of that um I don't know if anyone else had thoughts about that but the Cain and Abel story as uh, something in the background. Go you ahead. know, the, uh, Pip really fails in his obligation there to his fellow man, or he wants to. He doesn't want to take mad with John. But I think it relates back also to the tremendous amount of guilt that Pip feels throughout. He starts as an extremely guilty child, uh, you know, for stealing the pie and the brandy. But he's doing it to save a person, but he doesn't allow himself that that uh, uh, that thought at all. It's just tremendous guilt throughout. And he he does, of course, decide to take Magwijan and take responsibility for him. But the guilt is just all over the place. He can't get away from it. Anyone have thoughts about Cain and Abel uh, just before we leave that? So, Pat. Oh, I, I think this might be a little off the topic, although I don't know that much about the story of Cain and Abel, sorry to say. But, um, you know, there's so much manipulation, manipulation of people. I, I don't know that it's so much about kindness toward other people, but... Um, um, it seems to me everyone is trying to manipulate someone in some way. Miss Havisham, of course, Estella. 
um, has been manipulated. So Magwitch is really with the money is trying to manipulate a pip. I, it's just a fluty, a fleeting thought in my brain about this manipulation. We we sh we should bef before we leave Cain and Abel. I'll I'll just say one further thing to to uh, comment on that. Um, the Cain and Abel story is is a story of violence. Cain is the first murderer. He murders Abel. He murders his his brother. Magwitch is in some ways a Cain figure, despite his name as Abel. He's both a victim, but he's also, in Pip's mind, a violent murderer. And part of the reason, to go back to David's early question about um, the the money, what uh, um, why does why does Pip refuse or think it's it's not a good idea for him to accept money from Magwitch? Is that Magwitch, in Pip's mind, is associated with violence, and he thinks that someone as violent as as Magwitch, he who remember tries to strangle the other convict at the beginning of the novel. Um, Pip has seen. Magwitch be violent, and Magwitch, uh, it, it, Magwitch has two. I, I think of them as attributes, two objects that he carries with him, that uh, Pip notices again and again. Um, one is the testament that he carries, that he uses to swear people to, uh, to, uh, to keep secrets. So there's a there's a religious dimension to that, although Magwitch doesn't use it for devotional purposes, but he is using it. He's using it in the name of, of, uh, of loyalty, of, of, of friendship. But the other uh, attribute, the other object that uh, Magwitch has is the knife, the jackknife. And I think that's the violent side of, of, uh, of Magwitch's character. And it's a constant reminder that uh, Magwitch has this tool of violence and is capable of violence. And, and so to, for Pip to associate himself with the violent man, I think is uh, something that frightens him and, uh, and makes him want to keep his distance. So Peter, and then Irene, and then Clark. Well, you know, I, I think of Magwitch and his relationship to Compuson. That's another case of class. Like Magwitch is actually taken advantage of by Compuson. Compuson is just a, you know, a fraud. He's a con artist and he takes advantage. And it's because he's he's smarter. Apparently he's he's uh, educated and he's, and he's just a, a bad, an example of an upper class con artist, you know, fraudulent. Anyway, the so the class thing again, and I, I would I just somewhere when somebody was t talking. Well, anyway, the the other thing I noticed about class in the in the um, in the chapter is the strange episode. The Magwitch senses that that uh, Pip is bothered by him, and at a certain point he decides that he said something that is low class, that he's low. Magwitch actually buys into the whole thing of class. Don't think that Magwitch is somehow another pure or something like But he, he says, and I could not figure out what it was that Magwitch you know, said or did that was like low class. But he's decided that Pip must, you know, be upset with him for being low class, you know, and uh and of course he is, but we don't know exactly precisely what it is, but uh, Magwitch picks up on it and says, I'm really sorry for doing something, you know, so low class in front of you. And then later on, it's, it's said again, you know, and it's never made clear what it was that he did, except it just is being, you know, <laughs> that he says that Pip is, um, so, you know, class is all over the place, you know, class and uh, in relate in a, uh, in Magwitch and Compuson class and relationship to, you know, his relationship to Pitt. Anyway, so anyway, that's 
I just thought I'd mention that, but that was strange. The strange episode where, you know, you know, Magwitch says, sorry for being so low class in front of me. Oh, I won't do it again. You know, <laughs> so. The um yes, that's very good to to notice. Magwitch says several times, I ain't a going to be low. He, right. he doesn't say low class. And you're when you interpret it you're you're adding the word class and i think class is certainly a part of it but there may be something else something some something more general or some some yeah i thought other. i thought i thought there was something moral or something that, that there's some, yes morally. there's something ethical something moral uh, that that magwitch it's a boundary that he does not want to cross he does not want to be low um, so we we should think about that some more but irene yes uh i'm thinking also of some more of the religious side of the the name of abel here uh i'm remembering why there was the rivalry between cain and abel that it was over the ad what the who would be the one acceptable to the father and it was Abel's offering that was acceptable and Cain's that was rejected. So you've got this rivalry of the brothers and that started in the original religion story, original Bible story that started the problem between them. And uh, although in the biblical version, it's Cain who is the one who is violent, uh, I think you need to look at the difference here that Abel, uh, that the, the Cain of the story here, that the... Uh, 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 the, the I've forgotten his real name, but uh, uh, the uh, other convict um, is the one who has had the opportunities and is able to use uh, fraud rather than violence as his method. And Magwitch, because of his upbringing, has no has no words to to use to defend himself. He only has violence. So I think that that's interesting that uh, his violence comes from the lack of opportunity of alternatives. And the other convicts had those opportunities and has deliberately uh, done so much evil, including uh, time and again, play, least placing the blame on Magwitch, you know, sort of, which is why there's this, you know, sort of ri the rivalry between them and why Magwitch gets so angry with them because he's the one who keeps getting him into trouble when it's not actually him who was responsible. Yes, very good. In in that version of the story, Magwitch is certainly the able figure and Compison, the other convict, is... Oh, so that, the, I've forgotten yes. the name there, Compison, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, Clark. I, Irene said what I was going to say. I was just thinking about the story of Cain and Abel, and I don't think there's some kind of you know, slavish allegory going on here in the book, but just a suggestion of the uh, Abel and Cain offer their offerings to to God, and uh, God picks Abel's carnivore platter instead of the uh, vegetarian fare that uh, Cain dishes up, arbitrarily chosen apparently, uh, uh, unless. God really does like a charcuterie board. Um, and that starts this, you know, jealousy that results in um, a death. But so it seems like the characters are at different times playing out those roles. In a way, Pip is kind of a cane figure in his desire to get rid of Magwitch. Um, so I just, I can't play it all out in my head neatly. It kind of comes in waves of <laughs> connections that then frazzle. Um, but I do think there's something going on there about the, the moral quality. Cynthia. I really appreciated that observation earlier about the manipulation of Pip by Magwitch and Estella by Miss Havisham, because both children who started out orphanish and poorish are being made into a lady and a gentleman, and both as adults reject their benefactor parent. So I wondered if that seemed significant to anyone. Good observation. Margaret, we'll, we'll pick up that theme of manipulation. Um, 
in right well i hate to come right after the woman who just spoke because she did ask the question about the rejection uh, are you saying uh that estella rejects miss havisham i and i don't agree with that i think that she's seeing things as they are but she doesn't reject absolutely reject uh, mrs havisham she accepts what has been done to her and she carries on and fulfills the promise that Ms. Havisham made to her. But the, but so that I, I feel uh, ill at ease coming after that question because I can't answer the question that uh, the good question. But uh, my point is, um, what about the name Magwitch? Is does anybody want to take a stab at what what that may, name means? Magwitch. Because I think that uh, there has been not much discussion in our meetings about the significance of names. And there was a, a, a little bit about it in uh, Professor Mekier's essay, which was presented at the first meeting that we had. And, um, but my question is, what is the significance of Magwitch as, as the name? That's all. Good question. Uh, does does anyone want to take a, a stab at that question? <laughs> a violent metaphor. <laughs> Cynthia, do you... I am uh Margaret is causing me to correct myself. I <laughs> I should have said neither one of these adults. Uh, I mean, Pip and Estella return the love of their parent. Yes, that's that's the form in which Estella's resistance to the manipulation by Miss Havisham is apparent. That Miss Havisham wants Estella not just to be grateful not just to perform the role that she has been trained to perform, but to give her love. And Estella says, how can you ask me to give you love when you have trained me not to love, not to know what that emotion is? So, Alexis. I was just wondering about the name Magwitch. Is the mag in Magwitch short for Magnus or great? I don't know what to think of that name, but that's an interesting question. Irene? I don't actually have an answer to the Magwitch one, but I'm just seeing more in the parallels of uh, Estella and uh, uh, Magwitch uh, and Pip in terms of relationship to the, the, the per parent figure. Uh, and, and we've got uh, Pip rejecting Mag Magwitch because if you like, Magwitch has corrupted him. Magwitch has made it impossible for him to love properly by taking him out of what could have been a loving environment for him with Joe, once his aunt is incapacitated, he could have had a chance to develop a as a better person, uh, a more loving pe person responding to Joe's love. Uh, and in the same way, uh, Mrs. Havisham, Miss Havisham, beg your pardon, has destroyed Estella's ability to love. So both of these, you know, sort of parents grasping for love have in the process destroyed the, the ability of the person that they're trying to get to love them by the way in which they've behaved and the demands that they're making on them. Yes, very good. I don't have a an, an answer to the question about the name Magwitch and I would, I would be interested if anyone does. Mag, Magnum, Magnus, great. Um, magpie, is there something bird-like? Um, I think at one point Magwitch calls himself an old bird. 
Uh, it's a it's a term to to use for a prisoner. Perhaps. Anyway, I don't I don't have an answer to that. But on the theme of manipulation, I'd, I'd like to ask you to look at a passage at the end of chapter 40, which is chapter one, is it chapter one? Yes of book three. And I'm in a different edition, and so I, I have to um, ask you to find it. It's uh, the last page but one of that chapter. And in a paragraph that begins, I doubt if a ghost could have been more terrible to me, and which picks up the Hamlet theme and the ghostly father theme that we have been talking about. I'll just read a, a little bit and hope that you can find that, that passage, the end of chapter 40 or uh, chapter one of book three. I doubt if a ghost could have been more terrible to me up in those lonely rooms in the long evenings and long nights with the wind and the rain always rushing by. A ghost could not have been taken and hanged on my account. And if the consideration that he could be and the dread that he would be were no small addition to my horrors. When he was not asleep or playing a complicated kind of patience, uh, that's a game of solitaire with cards, with a ragged pack of cards of his own, a game that I never saw before or since, and in which he recorded his winnings by sticking his jackknife into the table. When he was not engaged in either of those pursuits, he would ask me to read to him foreign language, dear boy. While I complied, he, not comprehending a single word, would stand before the fire, surveying me with the air of, a, of an exhibitor, and I would see him between the fingers of the hand with which I shaded my face, appealing in dumb show to the furniture to take notice of my proficiency. So an exhibitor here is someone who is the owner of an exhibition model. And so Pip is the the creature that Magwitch has made, and Magwitch is the proud owner who is exhibiting him in some kind of public display. And Pip is reading, and Pip's reading, I think, is, is an important part of, of, uh, of this chapter because of what he goes on to, to say. So we might even wonder, speculate, what book has Pip been reading? I mean, there's not an answer to that, but uh, what does he think about when he uh, continues? So, um, the imaginary student pursued by the misshapen creature he had impiously made was not more wretched than I, pursued by the creature who had made me, and recoiling from him with a stronger repulsion, the more he admired me and the fonder he was of me. So what is this story that Pip is referring to there? It's Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein. How does the Frankenstein story work in relation to Great Expectations? The notion of parentage and of monstrosity. What does it mean to create a being? What does it mean to be a parent? Is Frankenstein the father of his monster? What is Frankenstein's relation to his monster? And in the book, remember, he's not a monster. He's a beautiful, handsome, beautiful, handsome uh, 
intelligent creature. Um, he's he's uh, if in some ways, if you think, I mean, he's more of a gentleman than Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, don't think of uh, don't think don't think of Karloff. Think of the book. The monster in Frankenstein is a beautiful. The Mary Shelley. Yeah. Yes. Carl, and you're muted. Yes, but the uh, the creature is Estella. She's been created by Miss Havisham to wreak vengeance on men. So the uh, Frankenstein image resonates there. Any other thoughts about how the Frankenstein story fits? It seems to me that there's a lack of parallelism. It's like it goes both ways. You know, it's like a Pip becomes the monster, but he refers to he refers to Magwitch as the monster. So which is which? Is it Magwitch or is it Pip or is it both? You know. I, th I think Pip has read the book. Is it possible that Pip is even reading Frankenstein? <laughs> Maybe he misremembers, you know, like a lot of us. Well, I think he misinterprets. Uh -huh. He misinterprets Frankenstein. Yes, and I disagree. Oh, oh yeah, that... like he doesn't he doesn't realize that he's the monster that's he been <laughs> he does, yeah. Pip does not realize that he is the monster. He thinks that Magwitch is the monster. Right. And how is Pip a monster? Well, the monster, uh, for one thing, was not a beautiful young man. He was made up of this body part, that body part, all mismatched. And he can never find love because he frightens people by his appearance, even though he has the loving heart within. But at any rate, Pip is a monster because he's patched together from a part of this and a part of that. You know, he's the son of Mr. Pirip, which who knows what his position was, raised by his sister and Joe, which he finds, he was perfectly satisfied till he met Estella and she talked about his coarse hands and his terrible boots or whatever she said. You know, so he he's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then he has the grand opinion of himself and now it's being shattered. You know, so he he's in all sorts of different different uh, pieces of them uh, put together, you know, and, and, and Magwitch, you know, for all his rough exterior and his violence, he has a good heart. Otherwise, why would he take his fortune back and, and lavish it, you know, all these years on the, on this young boy, you, you know, he did much more than, than stealing a pork pie really warranted, you know, he gave him his all. And, and Pip has some very good impulses. Like when he gets his 500 pounds, he, he gives half of it. He wants to set Herbert up and, and make sure S Herbert has a little something to go through life. You know, but then he has his selfish impulses like, oh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. He, he's just uh, all torn in various directions. Very good observations. Yes, David. There's a parallelism between Magwitch and Miss Havisham. Uh, both of them are creating a, or shaping a child for revenge purposes of their own. Magwitch is not a gentleman and he knows he's not a gentleman. But as the people ride by him in Australia, kicking up dust, he's saying to himself, I can make a gentleman better than any one of you. And Miss Havisham, of course, well, of course. <laughs> raising Estella to revenge 
uh, the wrong gun to Miss Havisham, they're not in either case seeing the creature that they're creating as a person. Can you think of another instance of someone making a creature in the book? The two main ones are Magwitch making Pip as a gentleman um, and Miss Havisham making Estella in order to get revenge uh, on uh, men. Uh, we talked about the aged P as a kind of comic version of the father theme and a reversal of it. But is there a comic example of the Frankenstein story, a minor, very minor character in the novel? I'm thinking of Pip's servant called the Avenger. <laughs> Do you remember the Avenger? Who is the Avenger? And what is the Avenger's wife? Why does he have that name? <laughs> yes. Glenna. Can you? Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, the Avenger is a servant who's so proper that he makes uh, Pip feel his own inadequacy the more, um, that his own inadequacy as a gentleman. But um, I also want to bring up, in terms of making, early in the novel, Biddy is trying to turn Pip into an educated human being before uh, Magwitch and his beneficence appears on the scene. I'm not sure that that's an example of the kind of manipulation that the other examples um, show us. I don't think it's manipulation, yes. but I think it's transformation. Biddy is trying to help Pip. Right, but I'm just saying that Yes. There's transformation going on, not necessarily manipulation. Okay. okay. But transformation. So anyway, the 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 Frankenstein motif. Yes, Pat. Well, how about Mrs. Joe and what she did to Joe? I mean, she manipulated him. I mean, he was. Uh, she, you know, kept him in his place and in her various ways with the, I forget what her weapon was, uh, but, uh, you know, he was not a person on his, of his own right once she was done with him, <laughs> although he was a person in his own right when he was consulting with Pip as like a brother figure, but, 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 you know, he, she, he he became what Mrs. Joe wanted him to portray, I think. The tool that she uses is her tongue. <laughs> and the tickler. And the tickler. And the tickler. And the back of her hand. So we, we shouldn't forget about hands. <laughs> So anyway, Pip's misunderstanding of the Frankenstein story and of who is the monster and who is pursuing whom is, I think, uh, one of the ironies of this book that uh, um, uh, he he doesn't, he reads books because gentlemen know how to read. And Pip is reading, this, the, the whole chapter begins with Pip reading a book. So 
Pip is Pip is in a book. He's in a book. One book that he reads is Frankenstein. Another book he reads is the fairy tale stories in which the prince marries the princess and the fairy godmother arranges that. But another book comes along and crashes into him. And uh, um, that book is, is Frankenstein. But Catherine, I should let, let you resume. Where else would you like to take us? Catherine, you're muted. Thank you. Um, one of the things I just want to talk about was um, Magwitch's story from when he was younger. And um, it seems to me like he had a lot in common with Pip in some ways. Um, and I just wondered if people um to what extent you had sympathy for Magwitch and also to what extent you have sympathy for Miss Havisham since we're kind of comparing them um or is it neither for either one of them or um yeah that's that's I guess that's my question it's just the extent to which how much we have sympathy for those two characters well I have a lot of sympathy for Magwitch right from the beginning when the when they catch him up, he, he makes sure that, that Pip is not implicated in the theft of any of the stuff at the forge, you know, the file or, or the food, you know, right away he starts uh, to take a protective interest in him, you know, and then um, he could have stayed very comfortably in Australia. There's all sorts of people with all sorts of criminal backgrounds that populated Australia and he, he had all that money, but he wants uh it's not just that he wants to create a gentleman it's that he's genuinely you know fond of pip because of pip's generosity as a as a young child um and miss havisham um i don't know she's such a grotesque that it's that it's hard maybe to have sympathy for her um you know and her her motivation is so you know, really very basically evil to, to deny Estella a regular girlhood, but rather to make her, train her up to be a weapon to be used to, to hurt, inflict hurt on men. Um, I don't know how far maybe she is, to me, less of a believable character than Magwitch, you know, Miss Havisham. She's so, uh, I don't know, she's so, so grotesque, I guess, that it's hard she doesn't seem like a real person that just sort of is a principle of insulted womanhood or something, you know? Carolyn? You're muted, Carolyn. Yeah, I didn't have sympathy for Miss Havisham. She grew up very privileged. You know, how she turned out the way she did was the way she did, but Magwish seemed like I had great sympathy. He was like a throwaway person from the, the time he he came on this earth. And I did, you know, it was a very sad story. And I, I didn't feel he was manipulating Pip. I think he was like so many people, he was never parented. So I feel how he acted towards Pip, he was reparenting himself. It gave him an opportunity to parent himself by doing that to Pip. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was very beautiful, actually. His The tenderness that he showed towards Pip. One of the things I know, oh, um, Michael. Mike. Oh, my, oh, um, oh, I think we should have a lot more sympathy for Miss Avisham. Um, the notion of being frozen in grief is something that Dickens externalizes with her in a way that seems to me psychologically brilliantly acute. Um, the notion of being frozen um, for those who have experienced deep grief and deep loss, I think, is fundamental. And again, it, it's um, Dickens, you know, turns it into an external characteristic. He always reflects people's psychology and the things around them, in their clothes, and in their micro behavior, not 
not in psychological insight or internal dialogue or anything like that. I think it's absolutely brilliantly done and merits a great deal of our sympathy. Mm -hmm. Ms. Havisham in that reading is a victim of trauma mm -hmm. and she, she's frozen at that moment of, of the trauma. And what she does with Estella is to reenact the trauma and try and compensate for it. So I, I agree. I think there's psychology there, but in the usual way that Dickens manifests psychology, which is not from the inside out, well, sometimes he does that too, but from the outside in. But it's implacable grief turned to, you know, implacable anger. You know, there's there's such an anger component to her as, as well as the, you know, un unresolved grief. Um, I don't and know if they go hand in hand always, you know, the deep grief and turn to anger. I'm not sure. And the anger is also directed against herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Clark and then Karen. Yeah, I, I think it's always much more comfortable to have those who suffer become empathetic from their suffering. That's, you know, that's a popular story, but suffering can also just make you mean. It, mm -hmm. it's up to others' feelings and situations. A human being who's been deeply hurt it's not pretty. Um, so I, I like that complexity. Karen. Karen? Yeah. Um, I think that Carolyn's comment about Magwitch reparenting himself through Pip is really, really beautiful. Um, just that notion of the inherent sense of trying to be a parent, having never had a role model for one. Um, he doesn't know what he's doing, and yet he's doing it in the best way he can. So thank you for that, Carolyn. The other comment that I just think warrants some recognition, someone said, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who, that Pip is just patched together by others. He is a creation of other people. And so when, John, you say that he misinterpreted what he read or he didn't understand what he read, um, I think he doesn't understand reality. Everything is mysterious to him. He has no basis for understanding the utter strangeness of his experiences. And it makes me think, Anyone like me who counts the number of times the word hand is used, I love words and how much they appear in Dickens. So the as ifs in this novel, I think John Mullen, it was in the Artful Dickens counted 266 as ifs. And what that constitutes to me is the mysterious the unknown, the unknowable. I don't know what it means to other people, but for me, it, it just is this whole inability of Pip to make sense of so much because of how he was constructed and raised. And the psychology in this novel is ever more deep for me to look at every time I read it. Yeah. Very good. Josephine. This is our conversation about um, Ms. Havisham and Magwitch and now Pip is reminding me because I come at this through um, psychology research. There is a guy named Dan McAdams who interviews adults and collects life stories. And one of the themes that he finds, two of the themes that he finds among parent, among adults who have had some traumatic or really difficult thing happen in their life, like you could say Magwitch and Ms. Havisham has, is them kind of falling out in the theme of, of redemption or the theme of contamination. And it's not neat and it's not binary, but you can, but you can find people who will try to, you know, have some terrible thing happen and then they'll create some narrative of repair or redemption or they'll really hang on to a contamination narrative. Like once that happened, everything went south in my life. And they seem like, you know, examples of both of those. And 
thinking about how Pip is going to make sense out of his own life story and what his narrative is going to be, particularly given how few guideposts he's had along the way. Um, you know, that that he does actually, you know, find a way. He decides he's not going to accept this money and we can judge him for thinking it was okay to accept hers, but not his. But he does end up making a stand for himself and creating a story for himself that I feel like uh, he really didn't have a lot of, uh, he didn't really have a compass much uh, to guide him in. Ava, could I pull up a slide real quick? Um, could I show them slide 12? So this is a drawing of Miss Havisham that I think is pretty awesome. But um, this line that she says, um, when Pip says, you know, you led me on and she said, yes, I did. And he says, was that kind? And she says, who am I? Who am I for God's sake that I should be kind? Like she does not have any, she did, that's not even in her, in her repertoire. She can't do it. Um, I think it's interesting. It's an exclamation point and not a question. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to what people were saying about how she's sort of stuck in this anger situation and there's that's not she's not gonna find her way out of that she's not seeking to find her way out she can't I don't think she can so that actually makes me even though she's so mean I do feel sympathy for her in that way um okay you can turn that slide off and then going back to what Josephine was saying I, I think that um Pip is seeking some kind of way to orient himself now you know he's been so focused on Estella as a guiding star and now he and and on inheriting money from his head now he's lost in that way and everyone in the a lot of the characters in the book are so focused on one thing like Miss Havisham's focused on Estella and Magwitch is focused on Pip and um and and now you know Pip has to find a whole new whole new way of living um, I want to spend a little time talking about Drummle just because I think that scene with Pip and Drummle at the Blue Boar where they're like competing for the fire was kind of a funny slash sad moment. Um, can you can you put up slide 11, uh, Ava? <laughs> So this is them, you know, not even giving an inch to one another. Um, and Pip is on his way to see Estella and he he, um, he runs into Drummle and it's almost like, I don't know what you guys made of this scene, but it's almost like he's trying to like hang on to that of Estella being his, maybe it could possibly be out with her still. Um, uh, I don't know. Did anyone have any reactions to the drummel scene that you want to share? You can turn the slide off too. Yeah. Cynthia? I wonder, Catherine, if you see a parallel linguistically between not giving up the fire and not giving up the star, who is Estella. Oh, that's really interesting. Is that That's, symbolic of their fight? It seems like it could be for sure. Yeah, and then, you know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know yet that Drummle is gonna, is gonna marry Pip. I mean, Estella, sorry. Peter? Oh, uh, well, you just, undermine my uh, comment um, you know I'm, I'm struck by uh, like Pip's desire to 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 to, to prevent uh, uh, Estella from having to suffer Rommel's you know personality and but if he doesn't know yet then but he kind of suspects I guess but he just his 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 contempt for drum it's like he wants to save it I don't know why 
personally. <laughs> Why would he want to save his fellow? But uh, but he does. He's sort of he's he's const he's kind of masochist with. He's kind of stuck on Estella, and then virtually nothing he can do can like uh, dislodge him from his obsession with her. And he wants to even preserve her from you know the bad choice of uh, of uh, choosing Drummle. Anyway, but I, I, if he doesn't know yet, you know, then what's he doing here in this particular scene? Drummle's kind of a bad example of a gentleman, right? Like, um, no, he's a he's 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 a he's a bad example of what Pip might actually become if he insists. Uh, insist too much on becoming a gentleman himself, you know. Okay, I'm done. Any other comments about the Drummle scene or about Drummle more generally in the book? The one person Drummle is shown as getting on with is Mrs. Pocket with her pretensions. Their, their position for both of them is their only thing. Social status, social class. Yes. And money. Carl. Carl, you're muted. Not sure this is in the right sequence, but um... I was really struck by Estella when she tells Pip that she never deceived him uh, into thinking that she he, she loved him. It was it's as though she sort of respected him, and he's the only person she didn't try to deceive, uh, which is a kind of um, good to him that she doesn't exhibit to anyone else. Lennon. I wanted to bring up the issue of <clears throat> why Estella chooses to marry Drummle when <clears throat> presumably there are other men Pip accepted uh, who are available. And it's almost as if since, I don't know whether this is plausible or not, but since she knows she has nothing to give by way of a heart, she might as well bestow her person on somebody who isn't at all worthy of having a heart. Is that a plausible interpretation? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, They're both bullies. And isn't Estella kind of a masochist? You know, she is, okay, I'm sure he'll, you know, this guy will torment me. I don't deserve any better. I think there's certainly a masochistic element in Estella. Another thing I just wanted to talk about was the speech that um, that Pip gives to Estella at the end. And um, I was wondering if you could read that for us, John. It's the one, it's at the, 
It's the one that starts. Um, hold on, I'm trying to find it. Well, I actually have a slide of it. It's a slide, slide 14. Sure, I'll read it. Okay, thanks. Out of my thoughts, you are part of my existence, part of myself. You have been in every line I have ever read since I first came here. The rough common boy whose poor heart you wounded even then. You have been in every prospect I have ever seen, seen since on the river, on the sails of the ships, on the marshes, in the clouds, in the light, in the darkness, in the wind, in the woods, in the sea, in the streets. You have been the embodiment of every graceful fancy that my mind has ever become acquainted with. The stones of which the strongest London buildings are made are not more real or more impossible to be displaced by your hands than your presence and influence have been to me there and everywhere, and will be, Estella, and will be. Estella, to the last hour of my life, you cannot choose but remain part of my character, part of the little good in me, part of the evil. But in this separation, I associate you only with the good, and I will faithfully hold you to that always, for you must have done me far more good than harm. Let me feel now what sharp distress I may. Oh, God bless you. God forgive you. So that speech is pretty powerful. And I feel like it tells us a lot about where Pip is in his journey. Um, he's he's able to he's able to say goodbye to Estella and he's accepted that he's not going to be with her um are there any parts of that speech that stand out to any of you guys or did you have a, a any what was your reaction when you read that well, one of my one of one, one, one of my reactions was that the sort of idea of romantic love is self-sacrifice in a complete self-sacrifice to the other person uh, is something also that is in Miss Havisham. She has such an absolute uh, love for Compton that she she just subjects herself to him. She's blind, and Pip is blind to Estella. So I'm I begin to wonder like is Dickens committed to that idea of love as utter you know utter you know obliviousness to the other person just out of you know giving yourself to to the other to such an extent that you you obliterate your you know your ability to see what's when they become a problem you know uh, so so that that you know that that sort of idea of love is self sacrifice. I find that in Dickens, you know, uh, here and there, you know, in Bleak House, like Esther, Esther is like, she's so self-sacrificing, you know, it's fine. And sometimes the women, women characters in, in Dickens, but also like in Pip here, he's, you know, it's like he's, he's given himself over to her completely uh, to the exclusion of his own, his own integrity, you know, or his own himself. So I wonder sometimes about what Dickens is doing with that or to the extent to which Dickens ha has that as a value himself. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Martha and then Glenna. Could this have anything to do with um... Dickens' own situation with having a girlfriend and sending his wife off to, um, to other places. And um, this is his feelings regarding um, 
now? The biographical reading is always hovering in the background, but I I think we should stick to to Pitt and not displace it onto on okay. Dickens himself. But the question that you raise, Martha, when you make that observation or ask that question, is whether this is, as Peter would suggest, an instance of blind devotion and again Pip deceiving himself, or whether this is a noble statement, whether this is a, a statement, perhaps Pip's finest hour up to this point uh, of acknowledging, although he hates the thought that Estella will never love him and will marry Bentley Drummle. Mm -hmm. And of the fact that he loves her anyway. Is, is this Pip's finest hour or is this yet again an instance of self-deception? That's those those are or some some somewhere in between or some combination of those two. Glenna. Well, I don't think it's blind devotion because he says that she has evil in her as well as, as good, and that he's going to choose to focus on the good. And I think, I mean, for me at least, some of the most interesting literary characters are those who have a kind of an obsession or a, an unwavering devotion to people that they can still see in a clear-eyed way, see the fault. Faults. I mean, it's not just idolatry of, of another human being. One of my favorite, other than Dickens, <laughs> authors is Pushkin. And in Eugene Onegin, the character of Tatiana falls in love with Onegin when she's a young girl. And then she goes to his library after he's rejected her and sees the works of Byron. And she realizes that he's a more shallow person than uh, she had fully understood at first. And she doesn't, in fact, she in the end rejects him herself, but she is devoted to him nonetheless. And I think it's that, it's a fascinating mixture of people. And I think there are people, these, this is not something only to be found in literature, where you can see that the person isn't all you might want them to be, but there's a devotion there nonetheless. And I think, yes, I think this is Pip's finest hour, and I don't think it's blind devotion. Pat. Sure. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say, I think uh, this demonstrates Pip's worst hour, because <laughs> if what he is saying is what he really feels that Miss Hattersham has achieved what she wanted to achieve with Estella. Um, she has uh, manipulated Estella in such a way that she could charm, uh, charm the spots of her frog. I don't know if there's a saying, but I can't remember it. So I, I think it's it's very sad it's sad for him that he has been manipulated. That's what I think, although I think he believes all what he's saying. <laughs> okay. Karen. Uh, yeah, I think, in fact, this is Pip's finest hour. He is realistic. He has an unwavering devotion to someone he knows can hurt him destroy him, has the potential for evil. And I think he raises in this paragraph the proverbial question, who do we fall in love with and why? And it's an unanswerable, I think, but we see it over and over in opera, in literature, in 
uh, everything. And I think this is a, a really beautiful, beautiful passage. We've got an interesting divergence of opinion about this, uh, Cynthia. I was interested in how this landed on Ms. Havisham, because in the paragraph immediately after the paragraph that Catherine presented, Ms. Havisham is a spectral figure with her hand still covering her heart uh, she was resolved into a ghastly stare of pity and remorse. I saw this passage as the turning point for Miss Havisham. She has repented now. She has seen with horror what she's done. She feels for Pip. And she couldn't have seen that if Pip hadn't had this kind of uh, outburst that he says he hardly knew how he got it out. That's interesting to think about Miss Havisham as a changed person. I'm going to, I don't know if I fully agree, but I'm going to look into it because that's a, I hope that that's true. Um, we're running out of time. Does anyone have any last comments that they want to make or things that they want to share before we close out? Before before we ask that final question, Catherine, what is you chose this paragraph? What what's your sense of it? I think I had feelings about it because in some way. I was like, really, Pip? You know, it doesn't seem like you got you guys haven't had that great of a relationship, you know? Like, why are you you're wapsing so poetic and this is so beautiful, but it doesn't seem to be tied to it's just in your fantasy. You haven't really had this a connection with her. So I I love the speech, but I'm also a little bit skeptical about it. Mm -hmm. And he's giving her so much, um, you know, he's like, you're everything I've done in my whole life has been about you. And sort of what about all these other people who have formed him and created him and, you know, taught him and they all seem to, he's just so, his focus is, almost too much, even though I love the speech. <laughs> um, yeah. He's really an empty vessel, Pip. And he's kind of like a will-o'-the-wisp, whatever person kind of changes him a bit, and then he goes on to the next thing. And he's very childlike always. He feels things so intensely. Um, yeah. David? Well, it seems to me, particularly when we're young, so much of being in love with somebody is entirely constructed in our own, our own mind without having much sense of the personality of the person that we think we love. Uh, there's quite a bit of that in this book beyond Pip. There, there are people there, are, I, I think of Mr. and Mrs. Pocket. Uh, he married her without really understanding who she was going to turn out to be. Miss Havisham didn't understand who Compison really was. She'd made him into her mind, into whatever. Uh, there are probably more cases here, but I can't, I can't think of one offhand. But it's so much of love is in the imagination. So it sounds as if you don't think this is Pip's finest hour. Uh, 
I find it moving. Uh, it would be interesting to know if the if he was a real person and this were said and <laughs> there, ten years later he would say the same thing. Would he move on? One of the questions that we're trying to answer as we read this novel and that we can't fully answer, I think, until we get to the end, is how much Pip has grown, how well he has understood his life and the meaning of his life. And we have to remember that he's, this is a speech that Pip, the older Pip who's writing the novel attributes to his younger self. Um, does the older Pip endorse this vision? Does the older Pip see it as a foolish example of imagining a fantasy beloved? Um, so I'll leave that question open, but Mary, you, you get what may be the last word. Unmute. Yes. Go ahead. So, um, at this point, right before I went to sleep, I finished reading this segment and I came away with wondering how we would regard Pip at this point in his life if he didn't have if, if Dickens hadn't saddled him with a childhood nickname throughout his life, what if his name were Benedict or Hiram or, or Edward um, or something that, that doesn't seem so unreal all the time? And I think that it certainly it has affected my perception of him and his growth or lack of it or uh, his progress, I, just, I don't know. I'll stop there. I, it, it, that occurred to me. I well, wonder what other people thought about that. Names are always important in Dickens novels. And yeah. the name Pip is, is one we, it's one that he gives himself. Um, so he's self- and, and he doesn't give it up when he grows up or but gets he's, older. He's instructed that he can never give it up. Right. As a right. term of his um, right. expectations. But he embraces it as well. I wonder what effect that has on his growth. Well, we will take up the name of the question of names and the question of Pip's growth as we continue. We have. Two more months to finish this novel. Thank you, Catherine, for leading us into this wonderful section of the novel. And thank you everyone for, for coming. So uh, we will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you.